turn to Matthew chapter 1. Begin reading in verse 18 through the end of the chapter, through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, as we come to your word this morning, and we come to understand and apply it, I ask that you would give us, first of all, an understanding of what this text is teaching us through your servant Matthew. And then secondly, Lord, I pray that you give us a willingness to live in action with what we learn today. Lord, we ask this of your Spirit because we know that your Spirit is what we need, the Holy Spirit we need in order to um, apply your Scripture. And so, Lord, we beg for your people today that we would be obedient to your Spirit, that He would speak through the Spirit to us, through the Word of God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jewish marriage in the first century has uh, been relatively unchanged for quite some time when we read this account. Uh, A marriage arrangement would generally be proposed between two families, uh, usually of the same clan, and the father of the groom would expect some kind of material um, benefit or a dowry from the bride's family that would be beneficial to his family um, and beneficial to his economy, of his his clan, Uh, the least of which was not her ability to have children. It was a very important thing in that society. It wasn't simply because um, they were backwards or any way. It was, that's how you survived in an agrarian society. You had offspring in order to um, farm your land, to do your trade, to te- teach in that way. And that is why there was always such a huge emphasis uh, culturally placed upon having children in much of the Old Testament passages of Scripture. It wasn't a matter of nobility in that. It was a matter of survival. Survival of your family, survival of your clan depended upon it. And so that's why they emphasized it so much. And that's why women often in the Old Testament, you'll find them weeping in great sorrow um, because their, their value supposedly was that they were able to, the value to the family was that they could help the family survive by, by, by having these children to do this. And so it was an important part Another important part of of this, because of the idea of the purity of of having bloodlines that are pure, um, not in the same sense of the British kings during the Middle Ages, not in the same sense of a pure blood bloodline for nobility's sake, simply so that the inheritance could be passed on correctly. And because of that, you see the whole concept of this problem when you read the story of Sarah and Hagar and Abraham and how he... um, 
because through Hagar he had a child at first that sounded like such a good idea but then Sarah realizing that now the inheritance would not be to her descendants that caused great problem and so you kind of see how the agrarian society and how this, this impacted a lot of the culture and so another aspect not just the wife's ability to have children that was important in the arrangement of the marriage but in even when, she, when they were married her virginity was still intact was very important to ensure the bloodline to ensure that this was a true heritage for the inheritance. Interestingly, what we have here in this account is we have something that is a problem in both areas. Um, not in the problem of Mary having children, but in the problem of what are you going to do in inheritance when your wife-to-be is already pregnant? This just messes up the whole cultural idea. Everything's a mess. But going back to the marriage concept which I'm sure this marriage was intended by Joseph and Mary to be no different than their normal cultural marriages. They were not planning on birthing the Savior of the world. They were not planning on this. They were a Galilean couple who was intent on starting the family. We don't know how it all looked. We don't know the age of Mary or Joseph. We can speculate to some degree on both of them. But we get the idea that they were, he says, Mary was a spouse to Joseph, betrothed, engaged. It's different than our engagement. I'll explain that in a minute. But it was the, the courting um, was a process that usually took place over several years. Uh, the arrangement for marriage between the families was usually done around the age of 12. Um, that was when they were promised to another. The parents would enter into an agreement at that point. And, and sometimes, in some, some situations, they didn't even see one another until the marriage came about. But most of the situations, um, they did have time to interact and get to know each other and spent time together. Usually around the, ma the man's 18th birthday, um, around that time would be now the betrothal period would begin. There was nothing official. He didn't get down on a knee. He didn't propose. He didn't do those kinds of things. The arrangement was already made. It was simply an agreement that at this age, now we would begin the process of marriage. At that age, the betrothal period of the Jewish culture was far different than our engagement period. It, it wasn't preparation to see if this is the one you wanted to marry. It was working through how we're going to make this work because we're getting married. <laughs> There's no backing out. The same rules applied during marriage as applied during betrothal period in the Jewish time. So they would be planning this wedding for the next year, or sometimes even it was short as a month. It was, that was allowable for the betrothal period to be as short as a month in the culture. And sometimes that would be the case. Either way, they're preparing for this. The families are making ready because the marriage was a big deal. Interestingly, kind of anticlimactic to the way we think of marriage, the big deal was not the ceremony. In fact, the ceremony in a Jewish marriage was nothing more than both of them signing a piece of paper. And that was the ceremony, and it was over. But then after the paper was signed, then the celebrations began. And for a week, there would be feasting and, and, and excitement between the families as these families are merging together. And the bride and groom were treated, treated as kings and queens. They dressed up in their finest apparel and they would sit on high, high chairs, the both of them together. And everyone would come pay them their respects and would bring them gifts and food and all these things. And it was a, a great occasion that would take place. Um, it was economic economically important. That was how they started the new life, was through all these gifts that they would receive. It was culturally important. Everything about it was a big deal. It was one of the biggest issues in Jewish culture was the marriage feast. Mary got none of that. Joseph experienced none of that because God intervened in a way that they didn't fully understand. Because the text tells us that when Mary was espoused, when they'd entered into this betrothal period, Mary, no doubt, looking to that day, her wedding day, when she would dress in her finest, and they would sit, and all their family would come together. And in Galilee, this fishing town, most likely it would be everyone in the entire town would come. And there would be, be song and dance and food and wine and rejoicing. And we read in Luke that an angel comes to Mary and says, you're not going to have that. Instead, you're going to have something better. God has chosen to dwell among you, Mary. The Messiah is coming through you. And of course, Mary recognizes, first of all, 
the physical impossibility of this. Because she says right away, how is this possible seeing I don't know a man? Now, she's betrothed to Joseph. What she is saying there is, Joseph and I are honorable. We haven't done anything to cause me to become pregnant. So how does this happen? And the angel replies not with an explanation of the intricacies of the virgin conception, but simply says, with God all things are possible. So both Mary and the angel recognizes this is an impossibility. Humanly speaking, this is an impossibility. But not before God, nothing is impossible. So Mary knows this. Mary responds in Luke in a tremendous fashion. My soul magnifies the Lord. She loses out on the cultural dream, but she got something much better. She is going to be the mother of the Jehovah from a human perspective. But the account we read doesn't talk about Mary. The account we read doesn't give the perspective of the birth. In fact, we might think that there was a mistake by Matthew. I speak tongue-in-cheek with that. We might think that when we say, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, because it says nothing about his birth. It's not even about the birth. We have nothing about shepherds. We have nothing about a manger. We have nothing about an inn in Bethlehem. We have nothing about their traveling to Bethlehem yet. Chapter 2, they'll talk about them actually being born in Bethlehem. In fact, the extent of Matthew's uh, recounting of the birth of Jesus, the birth process of Jesus, is chapter 2, verse 1, when it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That's all it says about it. Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So obviously Matthew is giving us a perspective, or he's coming at it from an angle that's different from what Luke comes at. And the Holy Spirit wants us to see something different than the glories of the birth and, the, and, and, and even Mary's, Mary's thoughts and all the things she pondered in her heart as one who was chosen by the Lord to bring about the King of Kings. And Matthew is consistent with his theology. Matthew is consistent with everything he's been saying. In fact, the reason for 18 through 25 falls on the heels of what we looked at last week when we read of the genealogies. Because if you read the genealogies and you come to verse 16 of Matthew chapter 1, you'll see him coming all the way down, and he says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. Now we said this last week, we said that the genealogies found in Matthew 1 are recounting Joseph's royal lineage, right? And each one of them is the same. And so and so begat so and so. And so and so begat so and so. And so and so begat so and so. But Matthew intentionally comes to the writing of God's word and by the Holy Spirit's guidance, he says, or he doesn't say, and Joseph begat Jesus. Notice he doesn't say that. And Joseph was married to Mary, of whom came Jesus. So right away there's a head scratching issue when someone's reading the book of Matthew. You gave the lineage of Jesus, but you intentionally changed that last verse. You intentionally changed what you were normally saying all the way along. And so actually, verse 18 through 25 is an explanation of what Matthew means by that. What exactly do you mean that Jesus is the descendant of Joseph, but was not begotten by Joseph? What do you mean by that, Matthew? And so he's going to explain it. This is what I mean by this. I mean that when they were espoused, and then you have the rest of the thing going on there. And so this continues with what we looked at last week. We have no idea, though, in the setting of what's going on here, how old Joseph is when he was espoused or betrothed to Mary. Traditions suggest that he was a middle-aged widower. The Bible doesn't say that. That's traditions. Um, little reliable external or biblical evidence tells us anything about that. Some suggest that because uh, we see little of Joseph after Jesus' 12th birthday, and many suggest that he died, and it's very likely he did die at some point. I mean, um, we don't have anything of him later on, and we do know that he was a righteous man, and so he wasn't involved in Jesus' earthly ministry, but that doesn't mean he was old necessarily. People die many times. We don't know. We do know that Mary, the likelihood of Mary being a young woman is pretty high, given the fact that she is yet unmarried and a virgin, which was very unusual in that society, and the fact that she was espoused and she calls herself the handmaid of the Lord. Now, I know that term could simply mean servant girl, but it almost always means young servant girl of the Lord. And so most likely, from putting the pieces together, uh, we don't know how old Joseph, we know Mary's this young woman under the age of 20, most likely. 
And Matthew presents the birth events from conception through childhood from the perspective of Joseph, though. While Luke highlights them from Mary. And this, too, is evidence of Matthew's theological emphasis that we've been speaking about the last several weeks. Joseph is directly descended from David the king. Thus, his children could be legal kings over Israel if the kingdom of the Romans were to be won over. Which was always the hope, right? To be saved from the oppressors. And for Matthew's emphasis on Joseph, son of David, and that's how the angel even comes to him. Joseph, son of David. Highlighting the lineage of Joseph. Highlighting the point. We see the unique circumstances of this man who raised the king of kings. Certainly, as I said earlier, all the normal customs were in place for the coming wedding of Mary and Joseph. But scandal threatens it all. And will bring an end to the celebration. It's found out as we read this morning that Mary is pregnant, and yet it's during the betrothal period, meaning that any sensible person would deduce that Mary had, had been unfaithful to her promised husband. And now Joseph is in a monumental dilemma. What we know about Joseph, as I already mentioned, is limited. We don't know much about him, but the Bible does give us a little bit of sense of him when it calls him a just man, a righteous man, an upright man. We know he was a craftsman, a carpenter, a builder of sorts, either with stone or wood. The word could be used for either one in, in, in the Greek. We know that he was living in Galilee, and we know that he was fully aware of his Davidic roots. You know how we know he was fully aware of his Davidic roots? Several reasons. One, when the angel calls him son of David, it doesn't surprise him. But secondly, when the census comes to go to the house of your fathers, where does Joseph instinctively go? He goes to Bethlehem. He knew what he was doing. He knew who he was. He knew of his royal lineage. Of course, that meant nothing in that day when you're under Roman oppression. But if you could be free from the Roman oppressors, someone like Joseph would be the rightful king. And he was aware of this. Now, he wasn't the only one. There were many descendants of David that could have this same kind, by this time, that could have this same kind of thing. But he was one of them. And as we saw in Matthew, and I believe this to be the case, I think we see that he was directly through Solomon and the other kings as well, indicating he was the most likely choice to be king. We know he was just, he was upright, and this characteristic of Joseph is the reason he does what he does for when he finds out that his soon-to-be wife is pregnant with great deliberation. It says that he was thinking on these things, verse 20, or meditating on these things. It wasn't a hasty decision on his part. He, he made a thoughtful choice of what to do, and his thoughtful choice proved his uprightness in two ways. First of all, he was right to divorce her. Legally, legally he's right to put her away. She's been unfaithful, especially if, as tradition suggests, he's an older man. His lineage, his heritage is limited, and his firstborn is not going to be his. How many more children will he have? But he is also an upright man because look at the manner in which he looks at it. He wants to do it with as little as harm to Mary as possible. So he is a man that is legally right. He is a man that is an upholder of the law of God, but is also a man that in this text very clearly demonstrates compassion. Demonstrates compassion toward her. It says very clearly, and the text of the Scripture is teaching us this, it says the reason why he wanted to put her away privately was not to preserve his own um, testimony or his own name, but because he said he didn't want to make her a public example. He's doing it for her. And so, and even in the process that it says he meditate on these things. In other words, Joseph's laid awake at night. Joseph was thinking about this. This was burdening him and bothering him. And right before he does what is legally responsible for him to do, as well as compassionate for him to do, God intervenes. Because verse 20 says, but while he thought on these things, while he's meditating over this, this very difficult act, no doubt he loved Mary. And he's, what must I do? I must do this. Oh, what's the least impactful way I can do this? 
and an angel comes. And we have what we call the um, angelic um, attention-grabbing word. You see it all the time. Behold. Now, whether the angel actually said that or not, we don't know. In fact, it doesn't say the angel said that. Instead, it's Matthew putting it in there. And it's the word, look. And it's actually directed to us. Because it's in the, in the narrative. He's saying, it's, it's the idea of a, it's the equivalent of an exclamation point in our English language. And he's saying, so, so the setting is set there. This, what, a, what a sorrow. What plans they had. What hopes they had. What, what future they had. And it's all negative. But look, God intervenes. God intervenes. And he steps in. And he sends his angel. And he says, no, Joseph, son of David. Reminding of the covenant of God. Joseph, son of David, fear not. And the angel really has two things to tell Joseph. Just two things. First, Mary, Mary, this is hard. I was thinking of how I was going to preach this. Mary, Mary. Every time I'm saying that, it's hard to say. Get married to Mary. Do that. Marry her. The second thing is, name the child Jesus. Those are the two things he has to come tell Joseph. Now, if you're Joseph, um, would you not want a little bit more explanation than all this? You, notice, what does the angel say? Marry her, it's by the Holy Spirit. Um, how? Why? When? What? Wait, the, a virgin birth? This doesn't make sense. But the angel just tells him, do it. Marry her. And then eight days later, when you circumcise him, Joseph, you stand there and you name him Jesus. And he does an explanation of each of those. So he explains why it's okay to marry her and he explains why you should name him Jesus. And that's the content. That's the outline of the angel's speech. In this dream or this vision that Joseph has, we have quite the amazing account. This fairly simple two commands, take Mary to be your wife, name the child Jesus. An explanation of each. Let's look at those very briefly this morning. What they are taught, what, what, why the explanation of it? Take Mary to be your wife. Now understand that Joseph is not commanded to take Mary as his wife because Joseph, you ought to know better. You ought to show compassion to this poor, soon-to-be single mother. Notice that's not the, what's behind it, is it? It's not, Joseph, marry her. Come on. Do the right thing. It's not what it's about. It's not a matter of kindness or hospitality. It's not a matter of compassion or mercy. Joseph has those things, but that's not why the angel says to marry him. It's a matter of fulfillment of divine promise and beautiful covenant. It's a matter of fulfillment of God's holy word. There is something bigger going on here than the account of a young virgin and a man who's disappointed with his soon-to-be wife. It's bigger than this love story. There's something bigger than Joseph and Mary at stake here. And what it is that is bigger, it is the very fulfillment of what God has been promising since the very first man and woman. It's the fulfillment of the coming of the anointed one, the promised one, the Messiah. It's the coming of the King of Kings. And there is something bigger than you, Joseph, and something bigger than you, Mary, at play here. Oh, that we would get the idea that there is always something in God's divine plan of providence and His divine plan of redemption bigger than what's going on with your and my life. Something bigger than me, something bigger than you. And it's only by God's grace that we even have a part in that which is bigger than us. And here we see God choosing to come to this Joseph Carpenter and this young Mary and be able to bring about something that is bigger than anything in human history through this young, unknown couple. Of course, this should not be shocking to us as well, since the scripture makes it clear that we are not to despise the day of small things. God seems to like to put his big things in packages that are small. He likes to confound the wise with the weak. 
He likes to bring the foolishness to nothing with their words, the wise of this world, with his perfect, quiet will. And that's what we see here. No fanfare. In fact, it appears that Joseph, in his obedience, did the shortest betrothal possible. He said, okay, he took his wife and named him Jesus. I love the way Matthew tells the story. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, I know, but you notice how it ends. So Joseph, verse 24, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel Lord had bidden him, took Mary his wife, knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, called his name Jesus. Angel said, take her to be your wife, name him Jesus. Joseph got up, took her to be his wife, named him Jesus. End of story. That's it. What a beautiful illustration this is of God's providence at work in small people, in little people. There's something bigger going on here. Something bigger than an unusual pregnancy. It was legally right for him to put her away and it was compassionate for him to do so privately. But that's not the point. The point is that she had been chosen by God to bring the Messiah into the world and the child in her womb is the everlasting Son of God. But one of the re ways in which the angel explains this to Joseph. And Matthew wants us to get this point because no less than four times in this short passage he emphasizes this. And it is what we have called the virgin birth. Matthew makes it very clear by the Holy Spirit that this conception of Jesus was not the result of a human father and a human mother but the result of a spiritual miracle whereby the Holy Spirit of God supernaturally created a human life for the eternal Son of God in Mary's womb. The supernatural effect of the virgin birth makes this difficult to explain in details. That's the nature of supernatural, isn't it? You can't explain it. It's not natural. It's supernatural. But it should be significantly clear and sufficiently clear, no matter how we understand this, that it is true indeed that Jesus was born in a supernatural, conceptive way. Now, there's a little bit of a misnomer, and I'm not going to go correct our years of tradition. We probably shouldn't call this the virgin birth. Mary had a very natural birth with Jesus. It was a supernatural conception. It was a virgin conception that was supernatural. In other words, her birthing process was just like all other women's birthing process. But how it came to be was of God and supernatural. But how do we know this is so clear? Well, notice, verse 18, what's the emphasis? Verse 18, Matthew introduces the whole account before he even gets to the dream by noting that Mary was found with child by the Holy Spirit. By, or, or ek in the Greek, out of, from, expressing means. God used the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, does not have a body, thus it wasn't a physical kind of means of procreation. But he used the Holy Spirit to be the means for Jesus being nourished in Mary's womb. Now, people say, how is this possible? And of course, Mary said the same thing, right? How is this possible? And nothing besides the resurrection of Jesus has come upon disrepute and attacked by the secular world more than the virgin conception of Jesus. It's so impossible. And it is. That's the point. It's supposed to be impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's supposed to be supernatural. But it's no more impossible, no more amazing than the Holy Spirit of God hovering over a mass of nothingness and from that springing our entire world. Holy Spirit in some spiritual fashion hovers over Mary and from that springs life. Now, I don't know the technicalities and you can go on to um, discussions and debates galore with people concerning the technicalities. Did God use Mary's ovum and fertilize it in a supernatural way or did he just basically, and so she was the DNA mother of Jesus or did God create a life um, out of nothing? He can do that too, right? And he just places that like Mary was a surrogate. I don't know. And there's actually arguments on both sides that make sense. And you know what? The scripture doesn't tell us that. Could he not have explained it? Yeah, instead he says it's of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural. It's not, there's no human explanation for it. 
But then in verse 20, he says it again. In a dream, the angel says it, for of that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. So that's twice in this short account. And then again, just in case we missed it, in verse 23, in the Old Testament connection, he quotes Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin shall be with child. Let's make sure we understand this, that we're not missing it. And some have suggested, well, the word virgin there in the Hebrew in Isaiah 7 means young maiden. It doesn't mean that she was really a virgin. That's the way the liberals, theological liberals have tried to explain it there. And I give them some credit. In the Hebrew, the word used for virgin actually could mean just young woman. It doesn't mean necessarily one who is a virgin. But you know what's fascinating about God's Holy Spirit and His Word? That when... Matthew, or the angel, quotes the Old Testament passage, Isaiah 7.14, in Greek. He uses a Greek word for virgin that almost exclusively means virgin. So we actually get the Holy Spirit's interpretation of Isaiah 7.14. And whatever the word means, the Holy Spirit makes it clear, in Isaiah 7.14, I was talking about a virgin. <laughs> For all the theological liberals that think they're smarter than me, this is what the Holy Spirit's saying, not me. He's saying, I want to tell you, look at Matthew, it's very clear, whatever Isaiah meant, this is what it was. A virgin. So there, he makes it clear, a virgin conceives. Verse 25, just to put it together, one more last period on the sentence, and they did not know each other. Of course, that word know is the, is the cultural way of saying they did not have sexual relations with one another until the child was born. So, four times, Matthew in this few verses wants to make sure we under get it. It was a virgin birth. You get it? It was a virgin birth. You get it? It was a virgin birth. You get it? It was a virgin birth. <laughs> over and over again, the emphasis is there. Thus, regardless of what it means in the context, those who seek to undermine the virgin birth undermine the authority, inspiration, and veracity of God himself. There is no way around it. You cannot deny the virgin birth and claim to believe God's word. It's impossible. So, what does all this mean? Why the virgin birth? I'm going to tell you something that I hate to say. I don't know. I don't know. The scripture doesn't explain that. Now, people have tried to extrapolate from this. Oh, well, because sin is passed on from man to man to man, and then he didn't have a human father, therefore he didn't have sin. But the problem is, Mary had sin. Right? And does that mean that only men are sinners? No, in fact, some make the argument, I know there are some good people out there that make that argument, I don't believe that sin passes down through some kind of natural DNA code, that we have some kind of sin gene in us. You know, one of the reasons I don't believe that is that, that then if we have a sin gene that gets just get passed down through the male and not through the female, only through the Y chromosome, not, if that's the case, um, <clears throat> then maybe we should support genetic modification to modify out the sin gene. No, sin is a spiritual nature. Sin passes on spiritually, and the spiritual is not tangible. You can't touch the spirit. Sin passes on spiritually. So I don't, I don't know, but I do know this. I do know that it was supernatural, and I do know that it was God placing the eternal Son of God in the womb of Mary. Whether he used her body or not, I don't know. I know it was God placing the eternal Son of God of God in a woman. Thus, fully God, fully man. Thus, able to identify with his people as seed of the woman, and thus, able to die for his people as son of God. So a denial of the virgin birth, a denial of the supernatural conception, the way that God has ordained it, is an attack on the very cross of Christ. It's an attack on the very work of Christ and the ability of the gospel to save sinners. And Matthew wants to make it clear of this virgin birth. I know it was a miracle of divine proportions. So the first command to take Mary to be your wife was because God had sovereign, tells Joseph, take her because God has sovereignly determined that the eternal son should come through Mary. You're betrothed. Thus she is not immoral as was thought, but chosen to the task. God is orchestrating these things. And that's the main point. God 
is orchestrating these things. You cannot read the account of Jesus coming into this world in Matthew or Luke or any of the other places and go to John, it doesn't tell him coming into this world, but his pre-existence without recognizing God's sovereign power over Jesus' entrance into the world. God's orchestrating things. Men aren't doing this. This is supernatural. God is in charge and God is working these things. The second command is to call his name Jesus. Why Jesus? Well, Jesus, if you can follow my thinking here for a moment, Jesus, the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, is an English translation of the Greek Hiesu, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Yahashua, or Joshua. And Yahashua means, in the Hebrew, Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Why name him Jesus? Well, the angel explains it, right? For he will save his people from their sins. But did you catch the theological heavyweight behind those words? Let's say it again. But this time, let's translate Joshua, Yahashua. So this is what the angel is saying. Name him Jehovah saves, for he, the child, will save. Do you know what the angel is calling him? Name him Jesus, because he's Jehovah. You see, Jehoshua means Jehovah saves. Name him Jehovah saves because he alone himself will save. The promise is not just that he will tell you about Jehovah. He's going to be another prophet like Moses. Or he's going to be like Elijah. Or he's going to be like Joshua. He's going to be like these judges. Or he's going to be like David. He's going to be these men who come and point to the salvation of Jehovah. No, better than that, he's going to come and he's going to save. He's going to be the final Jehovah. I'm sorry, final Messiah. He's going to be the final anointed one. The chosen one. The judge to end all judges. The king to end all kings. The, the, the leader, the prophet, and all prophets, he alone is going to come and save his people from their sins. Name him Jesus because he is Jehovah God. You cannot miss the deity, the pronouncement of deity. People struggle. Many religions struggle over the Trinity. Many religions struggle over the deity of Jesus. And, and it's hard to explain. Please, stop trying to explain the Trinity and the deity of Jesus through things like eggs and apples and stuff like that. It doesn't work. There's no explaining the Trinity. There's no explaining the deity of Jesus. But there's one thing that a Bible-believing Christian cannot deny no matter what, and an unbelieving person cannot deny. That the Bible and Jesus and God and the angels and every prophet claims without doubt that Jesus is God. I can't explain how it works, but I do know that Jesus is either God or this whole thing is one big lie. Because Jesus himself claims to be God. And here we have the angel saying, He is Jehovah. You get that? This child in, in, your, in your betrothed's womb, Joseph, he was in the burning bush. He was at the Red Sea. He was there when the death angel passed over your ancestors. He was there when, when, when the Persians, the Babylonians and the Persians took your people and he was there when they re brought them back from captivity. He was there when David sat on the throne, Jehovah was with him. And he's here now. And so he quotes Isaiah 7.14 to emphasize the point. He says, yeah, his nickname, and not his given name, but his name, what his description will be is Emmanuel, God with us. You cannot, no one can possibly read this passage of Scripture and miss what Matthew, the Holy Spirit, is screaming to us. Right? God is with us. Now, what do you mean God is with us? He's with, us. He's with everyone. No, no, God's in Mary's womb. God's with us. Jehovah's right there. Maybe this is why Josh, Joseph got up, married her, named him Jesus. This is powerful, isn't it? This will change your life. So he does. 
calls him Jesus. But you know there's another reason why his name is to be called Jesus. Not why it's called Jesus, but why it is that the angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, you name him Jesus. There's a reason for this. Now, the angel also tells, tells Mary that she should call him Jesus too. But we know culturally that on the eighth day, what would happen after the child has been born, he'd be taken to the temple, and, and, the, and, the, woman would, and the husband and wife would bring with them um, tokens of, of the uh, um, purification, the turtle doves, or whatever it is that they're bringing, depending on their income and ability. Um, they bring that there, the purification, and on the eighth day in the, in the temple, they would circumcise, the, Joseph would be the one, the dad, he would circumcise his son, and at the circumcision of the son is when they would then give him his name. They would call him. Joseph's not the biological father of Jesus. Joseph knows he's not the biological father of Jesus. On the eighth day, the way this story ends with this powerful punch, on the eighth day, Joseph, take, Joseph takes this baby boy into the temple with, his mother, with his, the baby's mother Mary, stands in front of all the people, and Joseph circumcises him and names him Jesus. Now, he'd already had that name. It's not like Joseph came up with something. Joseph was doing what he was told to do. But what this is, is this connects now to the genealogies, doesn't it? Because on that eighth day, Jesus was adopted by Joseph. Joseph. And we have to understand something. It's mostly the same in our culture today, but it's even more powerfully in the culture of that day. An adopted son was equal in all ways to a biological son. Equal in all ways. Joseph knowingly adopts Jesus as his son by naming him. And thus, he is Joseph's legal firstborn. Thus, he, Jesus is legally given in the temple in the presence of God, just as promised years ago, Jesus, son of David. And this is the connection. Joseph, you go name him Jesus. You take him in. You make him your son. Because now he's the son of David. He's the son of David through you. So there's the fulfillment of the promise. You know, I think this whole account is so fantastic. Every time we read it, every time we study it, it, it still boggles our mind. We still don't get it. Every time I read the account of the virgin conception, I still ask, how? <laughs> I just can't stop it. And so even in studying for this sermon, I've read this text over and over again. I got, as, I got knee deep in all the different discussions about how, whether it was her ovum or what, you know, what, all the different intricacies of it. And the, it, why? Because we recognize how significant this is. This is, this is nothing to pass over lightly. This is God becoming flesh to give us eternal life. If God doesn't become flesh, all we have is eternal death. This is God becoming eternal flesh. This is God looking down with compassion on sinful people and saying, I want to save those people from their sins. Yes, I want to save the immoral, the abusive, the drug addicts. I want to save the wicked. I want to save the so-called righteous. I want to save my people from their sin. And to do that, I am going to do an impossibility and I am going to come on the throne of David and I am going to rule in the hearts and I am going to gather my people in, my kingdom in, and I'm going to return. And it all begins with this this very supernatural, unique event with these very simple folks, Joseph and Mary, and it is a pretty big deal. And we ought to make it a big deal. It ought to be important to us. But there are a few simple observations from this biblical truth that came to me while I was studying this. And the first thing that came to me is that Jesus' mission thus has been grossly misunderstood by our world. And they don't get the bigness of this. You know how popular Christmas is? And nobody gets it. They don't get it. 
to the dominant religion in our culture, Jesus' mission is to show us how to live by his good example so that we might attain divine hope. But if this is true, then that whole idea falls short. Because when he says, there's a child, Mary's pregnant, Mary her, it's a virgin, Spirit did it, but call his name Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. That phrase, he will save his people from their sins, tells us the purpose of Jesus. And if you believe that the purpose of Jesus was to be a prophet, or to be a good man, or to be a, a guru, or a martyr, or somebody to follow, or an example to follow of how we ought to live, then all the rest of your theology is going to hang on that idea of him being an example of how we are to live. Everything about it, and therefore the cross is something to be despised, because the cross cut him short in his example. I mean, if he was to give us an example to live, then God should have given us an example from him until he got old. When you're old, you need to know how to live too. And so the cross is a bad thing because it cuts short the example of Jesus. And the resurrection, well, that's just there to show us that, that we can rise too. You see, if your view is that Jesus is an example to live instead of Jesus is the one who comes to save people from their sins, it changes your whole theology your whole religious practice. Or as others think, that the purpose of his miracles is for us to learn to do good or because to show us compassion or, or to teach us how to live, to teach goodness and kindness. But if his purpose instead was to provide a sacrifice being fully God and fully man, born of a virgin, that would assuage divine wrath by his atoning payment. Then this also affects one's entire life. So people don't get Jesus' mission because they don't get this phrase, he will save his people from their sins. They don't get that phrase and they don't get his mission. I also observed that I think from this phrase right here, people don't like it because it means we're sinners. He will save his people from their sins. That's not what the Jewish people wanted, was it? They wanted freedom from Rome. They wanted the bad days to be done. They wanted the oppression to cease. And he will bring all oppression to an end by glorifying people, by perfecting saints. People don't like this Jesus that's portrayed here. They'd rather have a different Jesus because this Jesus says, I come to save you because you're an offense to me and my father. They don't like that Jesus. In fact, when Jesus himself would say this very thing, the Pharisees replied back in John 8, 41, we be not born of fornication. There are many who think that they were, apply, they were referring to Jesus' scandalous beginning. I don't know if they were or not. People don't like this, you're a sinner kind of language. In fact, a sinner will never come to a place of humble repentance and faith until he agrees with this statement that Jesus must save him from his sin. Until he agrees, I am a sinner and the devil is my father. I am not of God. Until a person agrees with that, they will never agree with Jesus is my savior in the way the Bible intended. But also, I observe, it shows us that our greatest need in all of life is salvation from our sin. It's not political action. It's not social reconstructing. It's not behavior modification. It's not acceptance and love and tolerance. What we need in the world today, what sinners need is to be saved from their sin, their own sin, their personal sin, their wickedness, their rebellion against God. That's what we need. Now, you get tired of professing Christianity, parading out all these other things, social action and this and this and this that we need in the world. And why is the church not speaking out about this? And why is the church, and they speak church in general, not speaking out about this? And what about the action on this and this? And what about this hunger? And what about AIDS in Africa? And what about this? And what about all these issues that the church should be speaking out against? And I agree that the church ought to be very vociferously public when it comes to righteousness. I agree with that. But we believe that the greatest need is not to have social change. The greatest need that we each have is that we need transforming change by God himself individually. One of the greatest arguments against conservative Christianity is they're only concerned about eternal life and they're not concerned about life now. 
And I reply with, not only, but I got to tell you, forever's a long time. Eternal life's a big deal. And we are concerned about eternal life more than anything else. Because when the angel of God comes and gives this command or this announcement to Joseph, he tells him the chief purpose of Jesus is none of those social actions. The chief purpose of Jesus is to save people from sin. It's why he came. It's why he died. The obvious question is this. Has he saved you from your sin? Have you called upon him as your Lord and Savior? Do you repent of your sin, your righteousness, and rest fully in this Jesus Christ who came to save you from his sin? He died on the cross because it didn't end with the womb, right? It didn't end with the birth. It didn't end with the Magi coming. It kept going on. And Jesus Christ fulfilled his message, mission when he went to the cross of Christ and he was separated from God the Father Almighty and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God was separated inexplicably um, um, impossibly a lot of impossible things going on in the scripture impossibly God is separated from God in that moment for that time and the earth turns dark and then Jesus cries out it is finished and he gives his spirit to the Father and he died for his people's sins what will you do with Jesus what will you do with this king of kings who came to save his people from their sins. Who came as son of David to rule and to reign in the hearts of men and one day on this earth. What will you do with this Jesus? Will you smile, pass by, and say, what a cute baby? Or will you fall down in humble repentance? This is your king. This is your God. This is your savior. This is your Lord. For those of us who do know him as our Lord and Savior, we rejoice in Jesus. We rejoice in these accounts. What's Matthew's, I'm going to close with this, what's Matthew's big theological picture? I just want to show you this because I think it's important we see it. Because what he is doing in these first uh, two chapters is Matthew is weaving together six proofs Six evidences that Jesus is Messiah King, God himself. And he's weaving these together. And so in verses 1 through 17, he provides the royal genealogical account of Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus. In 1, 18 through 25, he provides the account of Joseph, a legal heir of David, naming Jesus as his rightful heir to the throne, as well as proving the Messiah will be God on account of his divine nature of human or a human beginning. And each one of these claims, by the way, he quotes Old Testament passages to promote it. So in the first one, he didn't quote it, but it's actually taken from Ruth 4, 18 through 22. And then this, he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. And then third, he will do what we'll look at next week. He proves that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the royal city of David, even though they were from Nazareth. And then he quotes Micah 5, 2 to show the significance of this. And then after that, he'll also provide the account of the mysterious magi, the wise men from the east who come to coronate the child a king. Um, and although it's not a direct quotation, he seems to be alluding to Psalm 72, 10 and 11, where he talks about those that will give him gifts as king. And then he shows the hand of God's providence preserving the young king through the infanticide that Herod enacts to get rid of the supposed usurper. And he quotes Hosea 11, 1 to speak of the deliverance of out of Egypt, God brings his son. And then at the end of the chapter 2, 19 through 23, he shows that Jesus the king was raised humbly in Nazareth, as Isaiah 11, 1 indicates that the Messiah will be a Nazarite. And so you can actually trace Matthew's argument. If you want to get deeply into it theologically and kind of study it, you can trace this argument with each of these quotations or allusions to Old Testament Scripture. He gives six of them. And each six of them is one more building block on the other, saying as loudly and as strongly as he can, this Jesus, this one, he is King of Kings. And here's the proof of it. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is God of very God. He is the one only true God who has condescended to come to save His people from their sin. 
and Matthew's whole big theological point is to prove that Jesus is Messiah King and it begs the question for us that I already mentioned I'm just going to conclude with this Christian or unchristian brother or friend what will you do with this King how will you respond to him let's pray